Discover the exquisite beauty of Islam with our exclusive poster collection showcasing the 99 names of Allah. Each poster meticulously presents the Arabic name, pronunciation and English translation, embodying the essence of our Creator. Elevate your surroundings with these high-quality designs that not only serve as art, but also offer a glimpse into the profound beauty of Islamic culture. Immerse yourself in the collection and unveil the magnificence of the 99 names. Links in the description box. Alright guys, welcome back to the channel if you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, today we're going to react to the pagan origins of Christianity. On the channel, many prophets, one message. I don't necessarily agree with the title the pagan origins of Christianity because I believe the origin of Christianity initially was of course Jesus Christ and therefore in our opinion pure monotheism. However, I would not disagree that Christianity has been infused with paganism, with Roman Greek paganism indeed. Guys, before we start this video, as always, if you enjoy my content, leave me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and check out the links in the description box to further support. And now, with no further ado, let's have a look. Judaism, Christianity and Islam are typically grouped together under the same umbrella of Abrahamic religion. Sure. This video is going to show that far from being a religion in the monotheistic lineage of Abraham, Christianity, in fact, has its origin in pagan cults. Yeah, I would make the bold claim that only Islam follows Abraham's teaching, because if we look into the story of Abraham, everybody agrees here, Abraham was not a Christian, and moreover, Abraham was not a Jew. So therefore, the question, what was he? Abraham submitted his will to God, to God alone. He even went so far that he would have sacrificed his firstborn son to God. This is someone that submits his will to God. This is somebody that worships God alone, i.e. this is what we call a Muslim. We do not believe that Islam started with the Prophet Muhammad wasalam, but we believe that it is the primordial religion of men, that there is only one relationship, so to speak, between men and God, the absolute submission of one's will to the will of God. And if you look at Abraham, you will clearly understand that this is what he did. He wasn't labeled with a religious affiliation such as Christians or Jews. He was someone, again, for the thousandth time, that submitted his will to God. And therefore, the description, the translation of Muslim, someone that submits his will to God, fits perfectly here, of course, and therefore making Islam the only Abrahamic faith. Christianity has the doctrine of the Trinity, in which God is said to manifest yes. as three persons, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. No, so it's not quite correct. It's not that God manifests himself, but rather that God has three persons. This is the description of the Trinity within the creeds of Orthodox and Catholic Christianity. It's not so much a manifestation, but rather an intrinsic part of God, an ever-changing part of God, so to speak, three personas in one. No disrespect here, but yes, we're speaking about a split personality, if you will. We're not talking about different manifestation or modes of existence, but rather of a God that has always three different persons. So it really is a split personality disorder, if you will. Compare this concept of three related divinities to different pagan religions. The ancient Egyptians had the trinity of Amun, Re, and Ta. An Egyptian hymn reads, all gods are three, Amun, Re, and Ta. Babylonians worship the trinity of Nana, Shamash, and Ishtar. Hinduism has the concept of Trimurti, in which yep. the supreme god, Brahman, is said to manifest as the three forms, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. The Hindu text, Padma Purana states, he who is that eternal God became the three gods, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. 
the Greeks had the goddess Hecate, whom they described as triple-headed and goddess of the triple ways. The Romans venerated Diana as Diva Triformis, which means three-formed goddess. A Roman poet wrote, O three-formed goddess, to thee I dedicate the pine tree. Northwestern European tribes worshipped a group of three female deities known as matrone, which means matrons. Persians had the triad Ahura Mazda, Mithra and Anahita. An ancient royal inscription reads, May Ahura Mazda, Anahita and Mithra protect me and my building against evil. We can see that this concept of three related divinities is an ancient phenomenon. Yes, and this is really important to understand because Christians nowadays, especially that haven't done the research, will believe that the Trinity is something unique to Christianity. When I was an Orthodox Christian, I was told, look at our doctrine, look at our theology. Nobody else speaks about this. They're speaking about God in some sort of simplistic, unitarian way, as if he doesn't have any multiplicity in him. It is only Christianity that talks about the Trinity and explains God in that depth. And therefore, many Christians truly assume that they are upon the truth because Christianity seems so special. Yes, it's true. Everybody else speaks just about one simple God, but our God has three aspects to himself. But if you look further, as you can see here in the video, you will see that this concept is extremely old and can be found within pagan religions. That being said, many Orthodox Christians still have an explanation to this, and they will tell you, yeah, well, this was some sort of prequel to Revelation, essentially, people slowly but surely getting prepared for the Trinity. It is truly that way. If you look into Orthodox Christianity, you will find that some Orthodox Christian scholars even try to find Jesus Christ within Taoism. There is a whole book dedicated to the subject called Christ the Eternal Tao. And there the author writes as well that those people have been prepared through those scriptures for the coming of Christ. Therefore, there's always an explanation within those religious affiliations, of course. And if you tell them, hey, listen, guys, people talked about Trinitarian aspects to their gods, their pagan gods. They will tell you, yeah, well, this was just a preparation for the real revelation to come, which is then finally the trinity within Christianity. Which has been present in different pagan religions throughout the world. It's important to point out that the Christian trinity differs in its finer details when compared to these other cults. Sure. However, this basic concept of three related divinities is common to all of them and is fundamentally pagan. The Greek philosopher Aristotle had this to say, about the mystical significance of the number three. Just as the Pythagoreans say, the whole and all things are delimited by the three, for end, middle and beginning have the number of the whole, which is that of the triad. Wherefore, we use this number also in the worship of the gods, taking it from nature as a law of it. In Christianity, Jesus is the incarnate Son of God who is said to possess yeah. two natures, one divine and one human. Yeah. This idea of a God-man hybrid is fundamentally pagan. Sure, Greco-Roman religions were Hercules, filled with tales example. of gods procreating with human women and begetting God-men. Yeah, here I have to interrupt yet again as a former Christian myself, because yes, it's absolutely true, the concept of the God-man is ancient. Pagans have been talking about that. However, within paganism, the God-man was basically a hybrid, 50% human and 50% God, such as Hercules, for example, he was a hybrid after all. However, yet again, the sneaky Orthodox Christians, they have an explanation to this, of course, and they will tell you, no, he's not half man, half God. He is fully man and fully God. He contains two natures. Like this, they believe they have an explanation, a sufficient explanation to this pagan issue. I, of course, beg to differ here. It doesn't make any sense because what does it even mean to have two natures to be 100% fully man and 100% fully God? That leads up to 200% 
which then in turn yet again does make any sense whatsoever because what does 200% then even mean? It simply means the fullness which equates to 100%. And if you have two in 100%, this makes it a split into 50-50 yet again. But as I said, they always have an explanation. They will tell you, no, we're not talking about those Greek mythological figures. We are talking about Jesus Christ, the God-man, which is fully man and fully God. God in the Greek pantheon, Zeus, visited the human woman Danae in yep. the form of golden rain and fathered Perseus, a godman. Hercules, also the son of Zeus, is another example of a godman. The New Testament states that the role of the incarnate son of God is to be the saviour of mankind. The father has sent his son to be the saviour of the world. The belief that gods became incarnate as men and acted as universal saviors was also common in paganism. Perhaps Superman. the best known example is the Roman dictator, Julius Caesar. An ancient inscription has this to say about him. Descendant of Ares and Aphrodite, the god who has become manifest and universal saviour of human life. Here, Julius Caesar is said to be a manifestation of the gods and the saviour of mankind. Another sure. direct parallel can be found in the Gospel of Mark, you have the, same about the beginning of Dionysius. the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. This statement that Jesus, the Son of God, is the beginning of the good news is also mirrored by another Roman dictator, Augustus. The birthday of the God has been for the whole world the beginning of good news concerning him. The concept of a human being who is a divine Son of God, the Saviour of mankind, and good news was a sort of template that was applied to people of great power and authority. We've seen that the history of paganism is littered with such examples, and the Christian conception of Jesus was just another incarnate God in a long line of incarnate gods yeah, it's not that had preceded him. That's the bottom line here. The early Christian apologist Justin Martyr, considered a saint in the Catholic Church, admitted that Christianity had borrowed its concept of divine sonship from pagans. When we say that the word, Jesus Christ, the firstborn of God, was produced without sexual union, and that he was crucified and died and rose again, and ascended to heaven, we propound nothing new or different from what you pagans believe regarding those whom you consider yeah. sons of Jupiter. To be fair, we have to mention as well why Justin Marda wrote this letter in the first place. It was, of course, for the conversion of the pagans into Christianity in the Roman Empire. So they had to make some sort of effort to convert the pagans into Christians, of course. And therefore, they did that by telling them, hey, listen, guys, this religion here is nothing new. Ultimately, Jesus Christ's religion, which we yet again believe to be Islam, was pretty different to the pagans, obviously, and therefore they had to change it. Paul changed the religion, then later on the church fathers even further changed the religion of Jesus Christ and of all the prophets, may peace be upon them, and then they started catering to the pagans. They started telling them, hey, listen, this is not so far-fetched, you know those stories, you heard them before, look at those holidays, Ishtar became Eastern, etc., etc., you name it. The Gospel of Matthew states, that Jesus foretold he would die and rise again after a period of three days and three nights. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Right. Very early on, churches taught that during his three day and three night absence, Jesus descended into hell. The Apostles' Creed Hades. is an early statement of Christian belief. It states, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. These beliefs mirror an ancient Sumerian myth about the goddess Inanna, which states, From the great heaven, Inanna set her mind on the great below. Inanna abandoned heaven, abandoned earth, and descended to the underworld. After three days and three nights had passed, Thus let Inanna arise. The Gospel of Matthew also tells us that something extraordinary happened when Jesus died. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection 
and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Now, none of the other Gospels mention this astonishing incident of the walking dead. Only Matthew reports it. Let's compare the accounts of Matthew and Mark regarding the death of Jesus. Notice that even though Mark's account is virtually identical to that of Matthew, Mark does not mention the rising of the dead saints. If such a miraculous event really happened, then there will be no rational reason for Mark to omit it from his Gospel. Consider that the Apostle Paul had the perfect opportunity to mention this story when he was preaching to an audience that was sceptical about life after death. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Paul could have easily proven that there is life after death by mentioning the numerous resurrections that took place when the dead saints walked the streets of Jerusalem. He did not mention anything about such an event because it never happened. Flavius Josephus was a first century historian who was born in Jerusalem. Even though he was a prolific writer and documented much about the city, he also failed to mention anything about this most public of miracles. Even conservative Christian scholarship rejects the historicity of this event. The New Testament scholar Mike Lacona stated that this story is a strange report and literary special effects. The theologian William Lane Craig stated that, probably, only a few conservative scholars would treat the story as historical. If Matthew's story of the walking dead is an invention, then from where did he get his inspiration for such a tale? It just happens to be present among pagan cultures. The ancient Greeks celebrated a three-day festival known as Anthesteria, during which it was believed that the dead came back to life and walked among the living in the cities. The Roman poet Virgil wrote that when Julius Caesar was assassinated, phantoms of unearthly pallor were seen in the falling darkness. Sure, of course, those were Greek authors. It is just common sense that they would reuse those stories. It's absolutely obvious. The Gospel of John narrates to us the following conversation between Jesus and his disciples. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Yeah. Here Jesus instituted the ritualistic consumption of bread and wine, said that to represent so his flesh and blood. Man. Just a quick interjection yet again here. This is one of those things, one of many things that really turned me off Christianity. I could never believe that this bread that I was supposed to eat was the flesh of Jesus Christ, that the wine that I was supposed to drink was his blood. And even if it was, what does it even mean? Why do I have to consume Jesus Christ, flesh and blood? It seemed so extremely cultish. I absolutely hated that aspect. It felt unnatural. It didn't feel like it had any Anything to do with the worship of one God. Once I entered a mosque for the very first time and joined in prayer, I felt such a relief because it just made sense. Ah, we're actually here in this mosque to pray to God? Yeah, well, that makes sense. So simple, so basic, but so surprising to somebody that comes from Christianity. Because you enter those churches and they're burning incense and then you have to drink wine and then you have to eat bread and turn in a circle three times, kiss the hand of the priest, kiss icons and whatnot. It felt so extremely unnatural and not like a path to God. Note the great importance that is placed on the ritual. It was claimed to bestow yeah. eternal life. All of this has precedent in the ancient Egyptian cult of Osiris. Osiris was believed to be the god of the dead and the god of resurrection. The body of Osiris was represented by bread. The valley there gives you, you bread from the burial of her father Osiris. Your loaves are Osiris. The blood of Osiris was represented by wine. My blood is drunk, even my redness. You are wine, you are not wine, but the guts of Osiris. The ritualistic go. consumption of Osiris in the form of bread and wine was believed to allow one to partake in the nature of Osiris and be granted life. 
And in turn, you of course had many mystery cults, ancient mystery cults, and there is some research done on that where people come to the conclusion that actually originally, initially, it wasn't even wine and bread, but it was a metaphor for some sort of psychotropic substance that would induce a trance-like state in which you could communicate with the gods, quote-unquote. And looking at it rationally, it absolutely makes sense because it is a fact that back in the day, during those ancient times, you had mystery schools that would initiate their disciples with certain psychotropic plans. This is a fact. And therefore, it would only make sense that those original experiential cults trickled down into history and simply became dogmas and copies of a copy of a copy of a copy, so on and so forth, until they end up speaking about the food of the gods. And then, ultimately, Christianity copies that ritual as well, now proclaiming that it is the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ, the man-god. Your eyes are opened by the earth, your limbs are gathered, raise yourself up, when the great bread and this wine-like water were given to him. The bread and wine ritual is performed in churches to the present day as a way of commemorating Jesus' resurrection back to life. In Christianity, the symbol of the resurrection is the cross. Most Christians assume that its design is based on the T-shaped Roman torture instrument. However, the Bible itself does not precisely describe the shape of the cross. It merely states it was made of wood or timber. You may be wondering where its design originated from. Like the yeah. bread and wine eating ritual, the cross... That point doesn't really matter that much because the reference within Orthodox Christianity is not just the Bible, just as in Sunni Islam, you do have Hadith additional to the Quran. Within Orthodox Christianity, you have to understand that it was those church fathers that actually compiled the Bible. And therefore, you have tradition and certain writings of the church fathers that further explain. And this is why if you look at the cross, the Orthodox cross looks different than the Catholic cross as well. Of course, Orthodox Christians do believe that their depiction of the cross is absolutely accurate and historical. Also happens to have a parallel in ancient Egyptian religion. Compare the Christian cross ah, to the, the Egyptian Ankh. Yeah. Their resemblance is not just in shape, but also in meaning, as Egyptian hieroglyphics use the symbol to represent the word for life. Here, the Egyptian god Horus is bringing a dead pharaoh back to life using the Ankh. We can see that the Ankh and Christian cross are both linked to resurrection. The early Christian historian Socrates Scholasticus recorded a fascinating argument between Christians and Egyptian pagans who both laid claim to the cross. When the temple of Serapis was torn down and laid bare, there were found in it, engraven on stones, certain characters which they call hieroglyphics, having the forms of crosses. Both the Christians and pagans, on seeing them, appropriated and applied them to their respective religions. For the Christians claimed this character as peculiarly theirs, but the pagans alleged that it might appertain to Christ and Serapis in common. Yeah, Just how did the original sense. message of Jesus transform from the pure monotheism of the Old Testament into the paganistic religion of Christianity today? I wouldn't claim that it is pure monotheism within the Old Testament either, because if you look into it, you have many polytheistic passages as well. Did early Christians get together and agree upon a secret agenda to corrupt the religion and the masses just went along with it? There is Probably no need Christians. to resort to conspiracy theories to understand what actually happened. When there are multiple ideologies in a geographic area, you often find that there is an exchange of ideas with the dominant ideology prevailing in the exchange. This is known as syncretism. The people who allow changes to creep into a religion are not necessarily doing it with an evil intention. It may come about due to pressure from society or ruling authorities. It may even seem natural to adopt certain beliefs and practices if culturally that is what a people are used to. Historically, this is what happened with Christianity. Jewish people were the initial target audience of the evangelism of Jesus and his disciples. Sure. However, they largely rejected Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus only gained a sizable following after he ascended to heaven, when the Apostle Paul started evangelizing to Gentiles, i.e. non-Jews. Paul preached a modified version of the message of Jesus that was stripped of its Jewish elements, such as circumcision say, yes. and keeping the Sabbath. 
this watered-down version appealed to Gentiles who started to embrace Paul's teachings in large numbers, Monotheism culminating in the pagan Roman right. Empire adopting Christianity as its official state religion several centuries after Jesus. So, we need to understand the mindset of the Gentiles who first received Paul's message in order to understand how paganism crept into Christianity. When Jewish people heard stories about Jesus performing amazing miracles, they would have understood him in the same context as the likes of Moses and the other Israelite prophets who were all granted signs and wonders by God. Alright, this is it for today's video. I'm going to cut it off here because as I said previously, unfortunately, YouTube doesn't allow me any longer to react to videos in their entirety. If you want to watch the full video, however, head over to the channel Many Prophets One Message and there you can watch the video The Pagan Origins of Christianity until the end. As I said throughout the video, Christians of course will always have an answer to why Christianity is not pagan. They will try to refute every single argument. But ultimately, they have to ask themselves the question, did Jesus preach those things? Did Jesus preach a trinity? The answer is, of course, no, he did not. Was Jesus circumcised? The answer is, of course, he was. Did Jesus eat pork? The answer is, yet again, of course, he did not. Did Jesus pray with his face on the ground like Muslims do nowadays? The answer is here yet again, yes, of course, he did. Did Jesus Christ ever claim to be a Christian? Did he ever call his followers Christians? We do not find any evidence of that. Did Jesus Christ celebrate his own birthday? Probably not. Did Jesus Christ celebrate Easter? Hmm, well, yet again, probably not. Did Jesus Christ teach you to pray to saints, to ask for intercession? Yet again, probably not. And did he ask you to pray to his mother? to Mother Mary and ask her for favors? I don't believe so. So those questions have to be answered first, of course. And then by answering those questions, we of course have to ask further questions such as, what was the religion of Jesus then? If he didn't do all of those things that Christians do nowadays, what did he do? What was his relationship to God? As Muslims, we say his relationship to God was that of submission. He said in the Father's prayer, thy will be done, if it is in your will. That clearly shows yet again that he is putting God's will first, putting God's will over his own will. This is someone that submits his will to God alone, i.e. a Muslim. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. If you enjoyed it, leave it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Check out the links in the description box below to further support my work. And as always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace.